911, what's your emergency? Have you ever wondered what happens when you call 911? Who are the people that answer these calls? How do they handle the emergency situations that get called in? What kind of training do they have? What's it like to work in a job where you're constantly dealing with people in a state of crisis and panic? Well, here's your chance to find out. Our guest today is Jim Keaton from West Virginia, whose 41 year career has been dedicated to working with 911 calls. He started out as a dispatcher and has been teaching 911 dispatchers since 1993. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much. It's a joy, joy to be here. Now, I'm sure some people watching right now are saying, wait a minute, this guy looks familiar. Yeah. That's because Jim is also the president of the Helen Reddy Official Fan Club, and he did a four-part series on our show in that capacity, which I highly recommend if you haven't already seen it. You know, Jim, I find it almost karmic that as a young teenager back in the early 70s, you wrote a fan letter to Helen Reddy saying that you wanted to commit suicide, which was kind of like a 911 call. And then you ended up working in a job where you are responding to calls for help. Is there any connection there in your mind or is it just a coincidence? Oh, no, I, I don't believe in coincidences, first of all. I think it's more than karma. I think it was divine intervention. I grew up in a very, very, as you know, rural area. We had no electricity, no running water. We had no phone, so there was no one to call for help. And I came from a very, very violent domestic background. There was a lot of domestic violence, brutality, uh, and there was just absolutely no one to call. And I think my life experiences prepared me for the job at 911, which I got totally by accident. I went with a friend to drop off an application and she asked the person at HR if there was a job I could do. And he said, can you type 20 words a minute? And I said, yes. And I took the test, typed 22 words a minute. They sent me to the police department. I was interviewed on the spot and hired that day. It was, had never happened before and has never happened since. So I think, and I always say, I was meant to have that job. What exactly are the job responsibilities of a 911 dispatcher? Well, if you can imagine the question, we've been asked it. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that people understand that 911 dispatchers are human, first and foremost. We have feelings, we have feelings about the calls we take, and we have button issues. So one of the things I teach my students is to be aware of what kinds of life experiences they have that they're going to be dealing with with other people that are going to cause them issues. Like, for instance, if you've had a, a relative who's died and you take a call for someone who just found their mother dead, it's going to be very difficult for you to handle that call. Um, we're expected to know everything immediately, know all the right answers, be 100%, 100% of the time. Because if your family is the one that needs help, you don't want to hear that I was having a bad day or I made a typo and I got the address wrong. It has to be right. There's no other, there's no other way to do the job. It has to be right. But what exactly does a 911 operator do? Well, first of all, we, we answer phones. We, in, in my department, which is Arlington County in Virginia, which is right across the river from Washington, DC. So we're a very, very busy center. Uh, we start out as a call taker taking non-emergency calls. Uh, and it can be anything from parking complaints to literally how long do I cook a 20 pound turkey? <laughs> to, uh, I had that question to life threatening emergencies. I've delivered at least three babies over the phone. I have um, taken so many calls where people thought they were about to die and I was gonna be the last person they spoke with. And my feeling about that is at least if that happened, I was a caring voice with them as they left this world. So that's how I dealt with the stress of it. But we get call any call you can imagine and some you could never, we have taken. And then what do you do when you get the call? So most agencies have call takers and some operate with just one person in the center, which I, I pray for them all the time because I don't know how they do it. Um, our center had call takers, designated call takers who would take the call from the citizen, enter the call into a computer. It would be routed based on the codes we use to a dispatcher, either police, fire or emergency medical services. and. So the right resources would go. And sometimes it was a combination of all three. 
while the call taker would, be, would stay on the phone and continue to get information so that we can feed it to the units that are responding to make sure that we provide as, as best service as we can to the person who needs it and so that we keep the first responders safe because it's a lot of information that we're getting um, that makes a difference between life and death, not just for the caller, but for the officer or firefighter or paramedic responding. Do you think there are any public misconceptions about what 911 dispatchers do that you can clear up for us? Oh, absolutely. There are lots of them. One, we used, I used to do something called a Citizens Police Academy. Our agency did that where we sent citizens through a modified version of the police academy and they spent an evening in the dispatch center. And I can't tell you how many people thought, number one, that the person answering the phone would be the person responding on the call, which is why they got so upset that we kept them on the phone asking them questions. Um, the question was always, why are you asking me this? I'm just gonna have to tell it to you again when you get here. So that was, that's the biggest misconception that we're actually responding. Uh, to the call. Second is we are not sworn officers. We are trained professionals, but we are not sworn officers, and we are basing our responses to what we send on someone else's assessment. I teach my students our job is to assess the situation, not to apply the law. So the perception of what somebody is looking at is what I'm basing my response on. So if I have somebody who is reporting a robbery and it meets the definition of a robbery, that is something being taken by force, threat, or intimidation. That's how I'm gonna enter that call. But when the officers get there, it may be something totally different. It doesn't mean I did anything wrong. It just means that based on the assessment of the information I was getting, I classified that call a certain way. Um, a lot of citizens expect us to give legal advice, which we cannot do. Um, they expect us to give medical advice. We have a program called the Emergency Medical Dispatch, which we use to give pre-arrival instructions, which means we're gonna do life-saving intervention before the medics or the first responders get there, but we cannot diagnose over the phone and we cannot suggest um, medical um, protocol to someone other than what's in writing on my card. So people expect us to, have, us to have all the answers to every question they could ever wanna know and they expect us to have the answer right now. Well, that leads me to the obvious question that you suggest here. What kind of training do 911 dispatchers get? Well, the, the training that I do is state mandated. It's uh, monitored by the Department of Criminal Justice Services, which is the Virginia agency that makes sure the dispatchers and all law enforcement get the proper training, proper recertifications, and everything that they need to be able to function in the job. Um, I teach everything from legal issues, uh, uh, interpersonal communications, stress management, um, how to deal with crisis, how to deal with your own crisis. If you're in, in one when somebody is in the middle, if somebody is calling a call in and it causes you to react in a crisis mode, fight, flight, or freeze, then you have to be able to control that because you don't have an option. You have to handle that emergency. Um, I teach uh, telephone techniques, dispatching techniques, how to handle panic and hysteria. I teach um, how to communicate with people who are difficult, uh, which can be very interesting because a lot of times the difficult person is a lot closer than you think. So I always tell my students have a mirror handy. Um, I teach uh, liability, how to make sure you protect yourself from liability. Anything that is going to help that dispatcher perform well in the job without putting themselves in a position of legal liability, um, I, I will talk about. We talk about diversity and inclusion, which is a big part of the class, because a lot of our responses are based not just on what we're hearing, but our perception of what we're hearing. And our perception may lead us to um, a, a choice of questions that could put an officer in danger. For instance, the example I use there, if you have a man calling saying that his wife is beating him, what's the first question you're gonna think? And invariably I get, well, what did you do to her? Or what kind of wimp are you? But if I reverse that and I say, what are, is the first thing you think when you get a call from a woman who says that her husband is beating her? It's all, always, does he have any weapons? Are you in danger, all that? So those thought processes can lead officers into dangerous situations if we're not aware of our, of our own thinking. 
how long does it take to be fully trained so that you can start the job? Well, it depends on the department, but our agency is fully trained. That means you're doing non-emergency, emergency, you're doing teletype, which is entering wanted people and stolen cars and that sort of thing. Call, I mean, sorry, uh, dispatching police, uh, fire and the EMS takes about 18 months, but there's a lot of certifications you have in that time period that you have to get. Um, some agencies do it a lot faster because they're smaller and they're not handling both police and fire. Our agency handles everything. You've talked a lot about uh, emotional impact. Is there a psychological test you have to take before you can get a job like this to it's, make sure that you are emotionally grounded and centered and stable enough to deal with this? It's funny you should ask that question. A lot of agencies do give a psych test. Ours did for a while and then they stopped doing it. Um, most of the agencies that, that do the psych test are looking for things like your response to crisis um, and your response to stress. We handle that in our uh, interview. And I can't tell you how many times I've asked someone, what do you do when you get stressed or how do you express your stress? And I get told, I don't get stressed. I don't feel stressed. Well, you're not gonna function in this job if you don't understand that you're very, very susceptible to stress in the job. Do most police departments have enough staff that speak different languages that if somebody phones in and they don't speak English, you've got someone that can take the call and understand what they're saying? Well, first of all, most agencies don't have enough staff to begin with. That's one of the, one of the crises in this profession is short staffing. Um, we don't have enough people working the job, and we'll talk a little bit more about the stress later about why that might be. But we, we have resources that we can use. We have some people that speak different languages. Uh, Spanish is the one we use most frequently, but we also have a resource called the language line or it's called voyance. It's called different things in different areas that we can use to get an interpreter on the phone to interpret for us. But the problem with that is if sometimes you'll have the person who doesn't speak English talk for five minutes and then the interpreter will say, she said no. No, I need to know every word she said because there could be words in there that mean something that the, the interpreter is not aware of the meaning to us. Can you tell us about some of the unforgettable calls that you've taken over the years? Oh, oh well, there's several that stick out and will always remain with me. The first one um, happened a long time ago. It was in the 80s. I took a, my father died from a brain tumor. And I, the first day that I went back to work, he, after he had, after the funeral, um, I answered the phone and everything was going well. A lady called to say that her three-year-old child had died. And I was doing fine until I said, had the child been sick? And she said, yes, she had a brain tumor. It was like someone hit me in the stomach with a, with a, with their fist. And I, I started to cry. And I told her what I had just gone through. And she sent me a card saying that she was glad that I answered the phone because I really did know what she was going through. I still have that card. I took a call from a woman who had been abducted in DC and she had been put in a vehicle and taken to an abandoned house in another jurisdiction, raped several times and put back in the car. And so her, her abductors were with her in the car. So when she called, it sounded like she was having a conversation with two people and it was just you know, like they were having fun. And I thought at first that she was playing on the phone until she called me a woman's name and I'm to protect her privacy. I'm not gonna say what she called me, but let's say it's Arlene. She said, Arlene, you don't know anything about Arlington. I'll just call you back later. And I knew that something was wrong. So in six minutes and 37 seconds, we were able to determine where she was, have both suspects in custody and transport her to the hospital. She was being driven through the area that I grew up in. So as she was talking about things that she was passing, I knew exactly where she was. I spent my whole childhood walking those streets. So I, it was another one of those times where I was where I was meant to be when I was meant to be there. That's and really it, remarkable. It was, every time I think of that call, I think what would have happened if somebody else had answered that phone? They could have handled it but would they have handled it the same way, not knowing the area like I did? Um, well, you another saved one, somebody's life. Um, in effect, yes. I, I, at least 
made it possible for, yes, I'll just leave it at that. Yes, I'll, I'll accept that compliment and thank you. Any other extraordinary stories you want to tell us? Well, um, I've delivered several babies. Um, and those are always exciting because, you know, you get to hear the baby born and start crying. So sometimes I cry with them. Uh, one of the worst, though, was a baby that was born that was not breathing. So we had to do CPR uh, to get the baby breathing, and we were successful. Um, they wanted to do an article on me and uh, have me on the front page of the paper. I said, we're focused on the wrong thing here. We need to focus on the baby. So the baby was on the front page of the paper and the story about how 911, you know, they called 911, we responded and the baby survived basically because of the actions we took. So um, part of your training actually includes how to coach somebody to deliver a baby yes. uh, over the phone? Yes, we, we, do, we do how how to stop bleeding, how to deliver a baby. I mean, there's like 87 call types uh, or crisis situations that we do um, pre-arrival intervention on. And it's amazing how, how that just three minutes sometimes can save a life. So if someone tells you that they've just been bitten by a rattlesnake, you would know exactly what to do? Funny you should say that. We took a call from a man who was returning from South Carolina he opened his luggage and he was bitten by a copperhead that was in the, the luggage and he didn't know it was there. And I have a card for that. So yes, we can tell them what to do. So you have like an index system that you can quickly look it up. Yes, it's called emergency medical dispatch. And it's, it's, it's a series of cards. So we ask a question. If the answer is yes, we go to another question. If the answer is no, we go to another question. So it's sort of like a pyramid of questions. And we ask the questions in order based on that pyramid until the medics arrive. Well, given that this job is extremely stressful and emotionally draining, is this the kind of job that people do long term? Well, we have two different groups of people, actually. We have some people that say, I mean, I've literally had someone say after the third day, I can't do this. It's it just I can't do it. And we have a group of people that stay in it for their for their entire career, like me, 41 years. Um, it depends on how you look at the job, I think. It's extremely stressful. The shift work, we work 12-hour shifts. We work rotating shifts. We have to deal with danger all the time. We have to know that we have officers out there that this could be the last day they're on Earth. Uh, we have to deal with knowing that when someone calls and says they're going to kill themselves, they actually may kill themselves with us on the phone. And then not just the crisis situations, but you have to deal with the mundane things. Like you take a suicidal call where the person, you're able to intervene and get help there in time and you're stressed with that. And the next call is someone who is as upset about a parking complaint as that person was about killing themselves. And it's like, it's hard to control the, re the reaction not to say, look, you don't know what an emergency is. Let me tell you what I just went through. But obviously I can't do that. Well, given the number of years that you did this work, how, what do you attribute the fact that you never burned out? Well, I, I did burn out. I, I burned, I, I tried everything to get out of this job. I tried everything. I mean, I applied for any job that I could possibly apply for, and I never even got an interview. And I got to the point where I thought, well, maybe I'm looking out when I should be looking in. And I started looking at myself and working on myself and working on my coping mechanisms and looking at my own life as a way to help other people deal with their lives. And I can't tell you what a difference that made. Coworkers are an extremely important support system. They're there and they're going through the same things we are. So sometimes a hug from a coworker saves the day. We have critical incident stress management, which is an intervention technique where we try to talk to people, dispatchers, firefighters, and um, police officers who have experienced a crisis situation uh, before they go home and go to sleep. Because if, we, if it's after they go to sleep, it sort of goes into the subconscious and then it's harder to deal with. We have employee assistance programs, which will help with short-term stress. Um, and we have, in my department, one of our philosophies was we need to have fun at work. So the best thing you can do is laugh. And I have to tell you, people who are not in public safety 
would hear us laughing about things and think that is so cruel and you are so mean, but it's dealing with the stress. It's not laughing at the person. It's laughing at the stress that's, that's got to go somewhere. So sometimes tears, sometimes laughter, sometimes we get up and we take a walk. Sometimes I'll take a walk with somebody else. Um, but all our stress management is not always healthy. We have addictions. We have a lot of um, divorce. We have a lot of abuse, family abuse. We have a lot of suicide. Um, I'm just, just in December, a friend of mine that I had no concept was having any issues at all shot himself. Um, I have known over the years, nine dispatchers in the last 12 years that have killed themselves most with guns because they know how to use them. They have the weapon and they know how to use it. And officer suicide is increasing incredibly quickly. Um, in 2020, um, 177 officers died from suicide. In 2019, it was 239. And so far this year, it's 32 already. Is that in the suicide. United States? That's just in the United States, yes. The whole United States. Well, yeah. given what you're saying, why would anybody want this job uh, to be a 911 dispatcher? That's a good question. And I ask that in our interviews. Why do you want this job? And there's two types of rewards that come from this job. One is extrinsic. That comes from outside me. That's my pay which is never enough. We never are ever gonna make enough money for the job we do, it's just not possible. Um, we get vacation, we get paid leave, we get sick leave, we get health insurance, we get um, other benefits like that. But the reason that most people stay in this job is because they feel like they're making a difference and they are doing something that is helping someone else to get through a crisis that they, could be in at any minute themselves, like somebody dying or an accident or serious illness and things like that. And most people who stay in the job do it because they, they want to make a difference in other people's lives and it helps them deal with their own. So that's where the job satisfaction comes from, that you are making a difference in other people's lives and often actually saving lives. Absolutely. And, and without us um, and 911 and public safety in general, um, people would have nowhere to turn. I mean, the hills of West Virginia, there was nowhere to turn. It's either you deal with it or you don't. And in our society today, the way things are, it would just be impossible if we didn't have somebody to respond in these emergency situations, house fires, as, a, as an example. In the hills, your house is just gonna burn down. That's, that's the bottom line. Here in my agency, our response time is less than three minutes. So we are very, very responsible and aware of how the response time itself affects the outcome of the situation. Um, and that's one thing I teach the dispatchers, that you have to be quick and you have to be accurate. You know, um, it, this warms my heart, Jim. When I was 19 years old, uh, struggling with coming out as a gay man, I called 911 because I felt like I was going to commit suicide and they put me on hold. <gasps> Don't tell me that. <laughs> so I took that as a sign when yes. nobody came back to the phone and I realized, I guess I'm not meant to commit suicide and I'm going to have to figure this out myself. So I think things have come a long way. Oh, we would not put that, put you on hold. I promise you, you would take priority. And it's but, funny you should say that. I was the first openly gay person in my department and I had some truly wonderful support system and support people around me who protected me. Um, another uh, call that I've taken that was probably one of the most difficult because one of the fears that dispatchers have is officers dying while we're on the radio. And my first officer in trouble call, that means that the situation is, uh, has devolved to this point where somebody is about to get hurt and it's probably gonna be an officer. And the officer was a friend of mine. And I knew when I started this job that I was absolutely awful. I was so nervous. I was so um, unable to make a decision that I thought, I used to hear from officers all the time, you're gonna get somebody killed while you're on the radio. So she calls, she gets on the scene and she asks for more officers. And I sent more officers. And then she said expedite, which means they better get here quickly. And then her next, um, transmission was 
1013, which means officer in trouble. And she was hurt, everything was fine, but she was transported to the hospital. And I went to see her at the hospital and she has all these bandages around her head. And the first thought that entered my mind is I could have gotten her killed. And I did get her hurt. Um, but she said to me, which changed my life. She said, I am so glad you were on the radio. And my thought was, why? And she said, you were so calm and you sound so sure that I knew everything was gonna be all right. And I wanted to say so badly, if you only knew. And I teach dispatchers that all the time. It's not what you're feeling, it's what you're expressing that's gonna make the difference. It makes the difference to the callers, it makes the difference to the officers, and it makes the difference to the firefighters and emergency medical service people we dispatch. So if someone were considering applying for a job as a 911 dispatcher, what advice would you give them? I would, my first piece of advice is know yourself. Know what you are capable of doing and not capable of doing. Can you hear people calling you names, yelling at you, um, taking everything out on you that's ever gone wrong in their life and still treat them professionally? Um, I always recommend that people come and sit in the dispatch center and listen to some of the calls that are coming in because it's not all saving lives. There are lots of parking complaints and barking dogs and noise complaints. We call those quality of life issues. And people get more upset about those sometimes than they do, you know, I, I can take being shot at, but I cannot take loud music I don't like. And it's, it's amazing the responses, how similar they can be. So I always tell them that. I always tell them that they, the process is long. And it's funny, I looked this up for Canada this morning and it's basically the same. You have to go through a long process to be hired. You go through an interview, you go through a polygraph, you go through a background check, you go through testing, you go through um, multiple interviews. So you have to be really serious about wanting this job if you're willing to stick to that process long enough to get it. But I always say, once you have the job, there is no job like it, good and bad. But you never answered the most important question. <laughs> How long does it take to cook a 20 pound turkey? You know what I wanted to tell that lady? <laughs> Butterball hotline, how may we help? But I, <laughs> I told her I have never cooked a 20 pound turkey that I will have to refer you to Butterball hotline. Um, and it's funny, you know, when I do my class, I ask them um, to sign a book for me because I've kept books my entire career of people, you know, what they thought of me, what they thought of the class, what they got from it. And I always include Helen Reddy in my class. I play I Am Woman. So I think that especially younger people need to hear the words to that song. And in the last class, one of the students wrote that I am there, Helen Reddy, and I probably will never realize it. That's very touching and quite a it, tribute to you. That I, it, well, it made me cry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim, for educating us about a topic that most people probably know very little about. In fact, I've never seen the subject of 911 being dealt with in an interview. So thanks so much for this, Jim. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And I just want people to know we're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, ready to serve. And if you think it's an emergency, call. Well, as usual, you're so articulate and interesting. And I really hope this interview has put the spotlight on an area of police work that is rarely discussed. Thank you, everybody, for watching. My name is Harvey Brownstone. A special thank you to Steve Silver, our producer. Thank See you, you next time.